My name is Renice. Let me just kick off um, things by giving a very warm shout out to the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation on whose land we are on today. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land and we are always looking for ways to stand in unity with First Nations people who call this place home. Um, but thank you for having us. Um, I have got an all-star panel with us today um, and this is a bit of a treat for us because we don't often get to be on panels together. We're just in a lot of panels separately so forgive us if there's a bit of banter as we go along but hopefully it'll help wake you up in between everything else and the caffeine um but we are joined by karen katz aka mama katz who is the founder of kk consulting about to celebrate its sixth birthday next week thank you very much um, all things hr this woman knows inside out and back to front we also have the incredible jess who is an account executive at salesforce fun fact about jess she just recently rene renewed her vows in vegas was it with elvis Excellent. I was really hoping for that. Um, uh, we like to do fun facts. I realise I forgot Karen's fun fact. Would you believe she has abseiled not once but twice down the Renaissance Hotel, Renaissance Hotel or As building? It was at the time, yes. It was a while ago. For charity. Pretty impressive. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have the incredible Michelle Lee, who is Senior Manager at PwC. And like all of us in COVID, got a few itchy feet. Unlike me in COVID, she decided to take four months off work and become a ski instructor in between her day job, which is pretty friggin' incredible if you ask me. <laughs> um, Girls in Tech, for those who don't know, it's actually a global organisation that was founded back in 2007 in the US. A lady by the name of Adriana um, kicked it off. She found herself being the only female at the table in her tech role um, and, you you know, I think like all of us who have been in a position like that, she did something about it, like start a whole global movement. Won't do that again. Um, we make up the Australian chapter. We're one of 60 around the world. We've got 16,000 in our community here locally and we put on events um, all through the year, all across Australia with the single purpose to really build a community and empower females in tech. So when we were offered the opportunity to come and talk to you guys today, we one, jumped at it, um, but two, really hope that we can leave you guys thinking perhaps in a different way. And I think, you know, some of the things that are happening now and it's 2024 um, deserve our attention and deserve us to start thinking about it and being aware of it back in our workplaces. So bringing me back to our topic of demystifying diversity and inclusion, I just thought I'd share a few stats with you that are here in Australia, so forgive me, um, but certainly I think shared globally in similar types of trends. So here in Australia, the workforce, the tech workforce, is made up of 26% females. So despite being, you know, tech is everywhere and females representing 50% of the population, only 26% of them are actually, um, I guess, participants in that kind of tech workforce. That number continues to decrease the more senior we go. And this is what we really want to start tackling. One of the parts of that that kind of breaks our hearts is that across the board, senior, mid, junior, women in Australia today, 2024, are paid 20% less than their male counterparts, which is not cool. <laughs> We're doing the same job. Um, the inclusion part, though, really comes into the fold when we realise 50% of women who are starting tech careers in Australia are leaving. There is something wrong with our workplaces. There is not enough of a community here where women are feeling like they can actually stay and thrive and build a tech career. And there are plenty of tech roles going, right? So we know that this ain't for the lack of job opportunity there is something wrong with how we're actually feeling included at the workplace. 
So to kick us off, I actually thought I'd ask my amazing panel um, just an experience potentially they've had where they haven't felt inclusion in the workplace because it takes on so many different forms and none of it's, I shouldn't say none of it, very rarely is it conscious. None of us mean to do this, but it happens. Um, Karen, can I maybe kickstart with you? Can you share an experience where maybe you didn't feel included in the workplace? I can actually share two. Um, and my first one was back in the day of work experience. I don't know. Do they do that anymore, the work okay. experience? Anyway, mine was some time before this century. Um, but I turned up at a very, very large tech company and there was myself and there was a young man, two of us, 16 years old, um, and hi, welcome, and the young man was invited to shadow a developer for his week of work experience, um, and I was given some reading material and left to my, to my own devices. So that was my very, very first foray into tech. Um, my second one was my very, very first job. Um, I was hired as a business analyst, and um, I arrived, and we were about to move um, building premises. And the guy said, oh, look, there's a whole lot of stuff on um, tables that need to be collected, like all the old stationery, what have you. We need to collect that so that, you know, we can take it with us to the, the next venue. And I went, this is my very first job. This is my very first week. Everyone else is busy working and doing their thing. And that is how it is that I was welcomed into my very first job. So there are team meetings. There are all sorts of things going on. I was not included, and I cannot tell you how difficult that was to overcome. Jess? Um, yeah, mine's probably um, what you would consider a bit basic or, or 101, but only recently, a few years ago, um, I was on the executive leadership team um, for a previous business I worked with, and International Women's Day rolled around. Um, I had organised a... Uh, event for all of the women across the organisation um, where I had two female board members that I was interviewing on the panel and I'd also organised an on-site event for all of the women in the division that I worked in. Um, so it was quite a task that I'd undertaken um, and after we'd finished the event, um, the operations manager sat down with me and said, you didn't organise enough cupcakes for my team. He hadn't been involved in any of the organisation for the day. Um, and felt that that was the piece of feedback that um, that he needed to give. Constructive. Very constructive. Yeah, yeah very yeah. helpful. Yeah. 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 Michelle? Um, so I, I've been in consulting, tech consulting, for about eight years now. And eight years ago when I started as a graduate, we probably had about ten graduates, two of us were females. And I'm just going to share a story that basically the definition of inclusion I feel like is very different. Um, across everyone and maybe just think about what it actually means to be inclusive. So for example, I, when I started as a grad, I basically, every single event, to feel included, I was told to organize the events. I was told to basically organize the food and everything and that's how they made me feel included. But really that was not how we felt included, right? I wanted to be the one that actually thinks about solutions, that actually does the work but that's just like a natural way of saying, okay, how do we make her feel more included? That's just something to think about. No, I think that's so fair. And if I reflect on myself even personally, I was sort of thinking how I would answer this. And I'm just fortunate. I've just finished up. Um, I, I had my own company for 15 years. It just, it just sold two weeks ago. I'm a lady of leisure officially now, which is a very weird state of play. But early on I, was, um, I had two toddlers and they were in childcare, and this was my own workplace. I was setting the rules. I was working 80 hours a week, did for 15 years, and yet in those early days it's sort of like I felt still like I had to hide the fact that I had kids that needed to be picked up at 6 p.m. and I would often put all of my bags and my stuff in the car at some point during lunch or the afternoon so that at the end of the day when I had to leave on time, I could just sneak to the car pretending like I was just headed to a meeting and no one would be any of the wiser that I was actually nicking off to go get my kids that exist and then, you know, once they're in bed, log back on and keep working. It's it's weird how it sometimes plays out in just the way we feel as well as kind of the workplace environment that we have. Um, 
So I guess on that, Michelle, perhaps if I could stick with you and let's sort of um, start to move a bit more positively, in what ways can leaders create safe spaces for sort of some of this open dialogue and constructive feedback with diversity and inclusion issues at the workplace since they do take on so many different forms and look so different for all of us? I honestly love this topic about like safe spaces. I'm all about that. So I love this question. Um, I think the first and foremost, most important thing is understanding people's barriers. Like we're all different, we're all human. Um, so really just knowing and acknowledging how people and individuals have a different type of barrier is so important because then they'll feel a lot more belonged. Um, so an example of this, a personal experience is, I mean, I'm an Asian female, obviously, and it's, we have this stereotype where basically we're quiet, we're passive, you know, we're listeners, and to be honest, I fit that mold perfectly because that's how I grew up. That's my culture, and we're told to be like that, right? That has been told to me so many times since I was in school that it's a negative thing, like it's bad, you've got to speak up more, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be more opinionated, et cetera, et cetera. But there are times where I just feel like I don't want to speak right now. Like I don't have anything valuable to say right now, so there's no reason for me to say anything. Um, and this is who I am. And we're all, so we're human, so we work in a funny way because instead of thinking about that's feedback, so I need to then do that more, I start to hide in my shell more. I start to be like, well, this is negative and I don't know how to address it, so I'm just going to hide and hide and hide. And what I found instead is I was so, so lucky and thankful that about three years ago I met leaders who really actually just told me those are strengths and it's okay to be introverted, it's okay to be more passive and gentle. So use that as a strength. And basically it just flipped the way I thought about things. And now it kind of allowed me to grow and now I'm in this position, senior manager, and I just feel like now it's my turn to start creating the, these safe spaces. So what I realized from that was in order to talk about these things is to give people power in seeing that their differences are strengths and their barriers might actually be strengths for others. Um, so I think that's the most important thing in my opinion. I love that. Um, Jess, perhaps I can go to you now. How do you believe diversity and inclusion contribute to the overall success and innovation for, for a company? And there's heaps of data that actually backs this up. So for all the data people in the room, I'm just going to guess there's a couple of you. It's there, but in your experience. I'm definitely not covering the data. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> look, I, I think um, the, the benefit of diversity and inclusion in the workplace is the multitude of different perspectives that it can bring to an organisation. Um, everybody has a different lived experience, they have a different background, um, they have different things that have brought them to where they are in their career. Um, and that can only be a benefit to an organisation because it, it allows you to swarm around business problems with different perspectives um, and tackle things in a different way. We all know that there's a multitude of ways to solve any one problem. Um, and diversity for me really brings the perspective to be able to do that. Um, I'll probably give you an example of a situation that I was in. Um, my first senior leadership role, um, I was promoted into the role with a female who had a very sim uh, similar career to me. We were in parallel roles, just managing a different region. Um, and we were put in a position where we we're expected to compete with each other. It wasn't that there was only one role at the end of the day, um, we were just put in that position by the leadership team. What we did instead was we actually connected together and collaborated together. Um, we would have a weekly meeting where we strategized, we innovated together, we supported each other. Um, and we actually both came out really successful. Our regions kicked, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but kicked butt that year. I think I um, <laughs> <laughs> We exceeded all of our targets. What that meant for the organization was rather than one region succeeding and one leader succeeding, the whole business did. Um, so I think that is valuable as well to understand rather than competing, how can we actually bring collaboration together and get benefits across an entire organisation, not just one divisional sector. Love that. Karen, in your experience, what are some common misconceptions or barriers that prevent workplaces from true, uh, achieving true diversity and inclusion and how can these be overcome? I haven't included in this, but, you know, we've all got diversity quotas and things like that, which is one part of it. But what's your take on it? My take is that 
as somebody who has been involved in the recruitment space for a very long time, if I had a dollar for every hiring manager that said, here are all the requirements and it would be really good if you could find me a female, I could have retired years ago. It's not about hiring a female. There is not one woman on this earth who wants a job because she's got a vagina. Let's just put that out there right now. <laughs> That's not what it's about. What I they saw are that would happen. <laughs> yeah, she was waiting. <laughs> What it's about is knowing that I have just as much opportunity to be hired into that role as the person sitting next to me, whether they are male, whether they are gender non-binary, whether they are older, whether they are of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander background, whether they are LGBTIQ+, and so on and so forth. It's about knowing that the opportunity is there regardless of who I am and what I'm about. So that's the first part. Let's get the job because we earned it and we're the best person for that job and there is no unconscious bias that is stopping me getting there. The second thing is what we're doing once someone actually achieves getting that role. I have a client of mine um, who were going through a diversity and inclusion review and I sat down with one of the women there and I said, tell me about your experience having come along here and she said, everyone's awesome, Karen, people are really, you know, they're inclusive, I'm invited to all the meetings, I feel like I have a place. She goes, but when I started here, I had a problem. I said, tell me about it. She goes, Karen, the welcome pack. They gave me a baseball cap that was too big for my head. They gave me a T-shirt that I could swim in that was sized for a male and not for a female. And they gave me a beer cosy, which is great, but I don't drink beer. And it's these tiny little things that we can turn the dial on so easily that will make someone feel welcome from the beginning. There's nothing wrong with stocking T-shirts in both male and female sizes. If we're going to go for hats, maybe a bucket hat instead of a baseball cap. It's the little things that we can do that make a difference. And inclusion along the way, the best way to understand how to make someone feel included, ask them. What is it that we can do to make you feel like you are more at home here? Ask the question. And it makes a hell of a difference. Um, I had the privilege of speaking at the Women in Emerging Tech um, conference a couple of weeks ago and they had an incredible speaker, um, a lady by the name of Daisy Wong. You should actually Google her. Bright pink hair, bright pink wheelchair. And her stories of her in lack of ability to even be in the room because there was a doorway not wide enough, mm. in this day and age, it's actually just not good enough. Inclusion means equal opportunity for everybody to be able to be in the room and be at the table. And it's really part of what Girls in Tech's about. It's about being able to be at the table and to have a voice. Karen, if you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you. Because I just want to ask you what what are some of the specific actions that leaders can take to ensure that diverse voices are heard and you know you said ask them seems pretty obvious to talk to yeah. them but if they're not asking how can they actually listen for some of these cues to know that they should even ask in the first place i think it's creating that culture it's empowering your leaders to ask the questions and it's creating safe spaces as michelle was alluding to earlier that people feel that they are empowered to speak up in the first place and it's having a look at your participation. Even when you get to things like social events, who's coming along? If we're doing, you know, a, a, a beers and drinks after work, how many people are we excluding from that because they have to go pick up their kids or there are other obligations that they have? Um, if we're doing a breakfast event, what does that mean? Does that mean that people can't get there in time? Again, dropping off kids or whatever else that prevents them. If we look at lunchtime events, is that more inclusive? As you know, and, and that's just one example. In the way that we run meetings, is it that we're waiting for people to just speak up or are we inviting to people to speak up? So, I mean, one of the things that I was taught is that you advocate for other people in the room. You've got 10 people in a room and nine of them are speaking and one of them is not. And it might be, as you alluded to, that they've got nothing to say. But if you, sometimes you need to invite them and you need to say, did you have anything to add? And there's nothing wrong with actually, no, I don't. That's fine. But you're giving them a safe space in which to open up if you're inviting them to do so. So the best way I think we can advocate is, is keep an eye out and be observant. Have a look around the room. Know what's going on. See the people that are not participating. See the people that are not leaning forward. And temper those that try to take over the room as well. There's always one of them and it's usually me. And it's like... 
That's great. Thank you very much, Karen. However, what have you got to say, Jess? Things like that. And I think that that helps you maintain that safe space and allows people to speak who ordinarily might not. Love that. Jess, if I can jump back to you and you touched on a few things that you, you've you done previously with the, the female and the in the parallel role, but what else are some small but meaningful actions that employees or team members can actually take to promote inclusivity in their day-to-day interactions? Yeah, I think um, Mish and Karen have sort of already touched on some of this, but like it seems really simple, but communication, getting to know the people that are around you in the workplace um, we actually implemented a, I think it was called Chat Roulette or something. It was a, a website that allocated you a, a person to meet with once a fortnight. And we did it during COVID, um, during lockdown, but it actually was quite valuable. We continued to do it after we came out of lockdown. It was an opt-in. So again, in terms of people's barriers, they didn't have to all sign up if they didn't feel comfortable. Um, but what it gave us was half an hour a week with somebody in the organisation that we probably wouldn't normally talk to. Um, And we had sort of one rule. Um, There was no business talk. So it wasn't about sales figures or campaigns that are going out or projects that were in play. Um, It was getting to know each other. So getting to know, again, what that that person's doing outside of work. Do they need to be doing 6 p.m. pickups and things like that? So you could get to know the people around you and you could understand them. And I think by doing that, that allows you to then advocate for them um, in those meetings because you understand where they're coming from. Love that. Getting to know people and communication. Quite simple, right? We can do this. Um, Michelle, turning our attention to something maybe a bit more positive, but can you share a story of a time where you've witnessed the positive impact of diversity inclusion initiatives in action, either maybe at your own workplace or somewhere else that you've seen it? Yeah, so I honestly think that it's a result of many initiatives that make things work. Um, It can't just be one thing that has a positive impact. Um, So things like the policy reforms, the like the values, the creation of values, and also like flexible workplaces, all of that combined is what makes a actual truly positive impact. But something that hit home to me quite hard, and it's actually got to do with the recruitment process. Um, So I mean, I felt like it made a huge impact, but Karen, she's the queen of recruitment, so she can tell me like that's not true. Um, But basically, I so our team started with very little diversity in general, and we made an initiative where for the recruitment process, we always have two interviewers in the room, and one interviewer had to be, just had to be one of the females in the team, right, or at least a diverse representation in the team. And that was force. And honestly, it was hard because say we had 10 interviews lined up, everyone else had only one interview to go to. So they took their time out of their days to go to this interview. Whereas the females, because there were only two, then we had to go to every single interview. So it was a bit more trickier, but because we had a passion for this, we went for it, right? We still put our time into it. And honestly, that made a huge difference because when we're interviewing candidates, they can see that there is actually people in management with a diverse background that can resonate with them, can understand them and connect with them, just simple things like just talking to them. Um, So it made honestly a massive difference. And that applies to me even in my career. I found that I left workplaces that didn't have a diverse representation in leadership. And so I went in the workplace I'm in right now, huge diversity in in leadership. So I'm here, and I've been here for four and a half years at PwC. Other places, honestly, I've left after a year. So that's a testament. Yeah, that speaks volumes, I think, for sure. Perhaps a question I'll kind of throw to all of you, and you touched on a few experiences you've had um, previously in the past, but addressing unconscious biases and stereotypes in the workplace, what have been some ways that you've seen these actually be tackled head on um, to to address? Apparently me. I'm still <laughs> thinking it through. It's actually really interesting. One of the, the stories I love to tell is when I had a, a hiring company who said, we want to try this concept of a blind CV. So we don't want to know the name of the person. We don't want to know their gender or their, anything like that. But we just like to just get the CV. So we sent it through. And all the hiring managers spent their entire time trying to figure out who this person was. It's like, this kind of defeats the purpose, don't you think? Um, 
I think Michelle's actually raised something brilliant in that if you can see it, then you are more inclined to want to work at an organisation where there is similarity. As humans, we're looking for a connection. That's just, that's a natural instinct. And that connection can be on any number of levels. But one of the most obvious ones is on gender. So if there is a female stand, sitting in front of you, you automatically have something in common. And so therefore there's a level of comfort and then you're more relaxed in an interview. And I think that that actually works very well. And it's organisations that make sure that you've got a buddy when you arrive who, again, you form a connection with and that becomes a go-to person and that's a level of safety. And we raise safety a lot in this space because that's what people need to feel. They need to feel safe, they need to feel a connection and then they will blossom and then they will grow in the organisation. So I think that it's doing it's, – it's, it's the little things that you do along the way. It's not a we will hire 50% female. I'm not even sure you can commit to that anymore purely because of the numbers coming out of universities in the first place and all the stats that Renice had um, mentioned earlier. When I, I actually studied a Bachelor of Information Technology back when I'm not prepared to admit when that was, um, and that was a scholarship course, and there were 50 of us, and 20 of us were female. So it was like 40% going through that were female in the first instance. And the number of courses since then have grown exponentially. UX and CX didn't exist back then, or if they did, they certainly didn't have labels. But the number of females who are even contemplating a university degree that even touches on technology, and the number of them are so broad, it's not what it used to be. So we don't have the pool. So if you've got one and you can make them feel like they belong, you win, bottom line. I love that. I want to open up to questions at any point, so please just feel free to raise your hand because we'll be very happy to talk about this until we're blue in the face. Um, but um, some small but meaningful actions employees can take to promote... Oh, I've already asked that question. It was duplicated my apologies um how do you think individuals can foster a sense of belonging and support for marginalized colleagues even if they are not in leadership positions um i'll ask all of you that and see who wants to answer it yeah i, I think it's not too dissimilar from a leadership standpoint it is about advocating for those around you um and creating that space for them so as an example if you've, you've had a um, offline chat with somebody and they had some incredible ideas about a project that, they're, that the business is working on or a problem that you're trying to solve as a business. And when you walk into the project meeting or a meeting with a leadership team and that person doesn't feel like they've got the space to be able to speak up, create the space for them. Um, and not calling them out because you want to be conscious of how that might make them feel, um, but calling out, look, we had a chat about that earlier, Karen, you had an awesome idea. Um, any chance you want to share it? Um, so creating that space and advocating for that person in the room um, I think is really important. Do you think rewards or quotas should come part into a diversity and inclusion kind of metric within an organisation? What might some of them look like potentially or have we seen any in the workplace that work? There, there are plenty out there. I think that... It shouldn't necessarily be about we want to hire 50% women. What we've got to do is actually aim for we want to make it an equal playing ground so that everyone has the opportunity to come on board to get that job, to feel that they're part of the organisation. The quota in, in the first instance, when, when you saw that come, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, it was really interesting just to see them throw the numbers out there. But it at least raised some consciousness I'm not sure that the numbers were necessarily what it was about, but the consciousness of we've got to get better at this, I think is is probably the positive that comes out of that. Because there's nothing worse than setting yourself a target and not being able to hit it, right? So rather than we're going to hit this target, how about we're going to do what we can to make everyone feel like they want to work for this organisation and then give them every opportunity to be able to do that regardless of who they are, where they come from and what they're about. If you've got the skills and you've got the ability, you should have the opportunity. 
I think that point around I actually want to work for this organisation is critical because there's no point for me setting a quota, hitting that quota, and then in six months' time you're not at that quota anymore because all of the females that you've hired to hit the quota have made a decision to leave the business because they didn't feel included. Mm. So I think that, yes, the quota is important from an awareness point of view um, and starting to, you know, show that change is needed. Um, but it's about once you've hit that quota, what are you doing to make sure that people feel included, that they want to stay there um, and they want to grow the organisation rather than leave? I mean, that statistic at the top about the number of women that are leaving the technology industry is an indicator that it's sort of not good enough to hit the quota once. It's how do you actually maintain that by creating an inclusive working environment. Absolutely. I might just add to that as well. And um, I feel like you don't really need official rewards and recognition. Um, a thank you goes a thousand ways, <laughs> like honestly. It's like basically if you're in a group and someone has done something, something tiny, a, a bucket hat, right? Something tiny just to show that we're being inclusive and then you saying as a leader, saying thank you for showing that um, and thank you for caring as well and thinking about everyone in this room, it goes a long way and it makes everyone else in that room think about it as well. I had a, in my organisation, we had a team of 100 and it was a fairly kind of young team um, and I was talking to one of our more uh a mature uh, team members. She was she was in her sixties, and she was just sharing. I don't know what they're talking about, and they're all Gen Zs who are just talking in another language. And she's like, I feel like the old woman in the corner. And we actually just had a bit of fun with it, and ended up having a bit of a a bit of a language course in in Gen Z language, Gen X, and baby boomers and everything in between, but um, it, it's something that I hadn't even thought about, but she was so right. <laughs> um, so even just thinking about the different ages and the different ways we communicate within a workplace, I think was was something I wasn't even aware of, but when she actually raised it, um, it was, you know, something fun that we could address and almost navigate, you know, what emoji we all chose in the Slack channel to to comment on something almost became a sign of what, what age group we, we found ourselves in. <laughs> it's actually really funny. Uh, before we started here, we, we popped a, I popped a photo up of us about to speak um, and my, my oldest child, who will be 21 next month, and that freaks the crap out of me just in case you were wondering, says, can I post slay on your post? And I'm like, damn straight you can. Put that out there. Like, that will just bring my age down. 20 is right there. I use a GIF emoji, a like GIF, and my kids just reel me for that. Um, side note, sorry. Um, did anyone have any questions? Yeah, um, thanks, guys, uh, for your great reading coming up there. I guess my question is more related to a different perspective. Um, that I had a daughter. Like how how what can I do for her? A very um, you know not even but you know very help help the cause for her. Does that sense? It does. It does. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone like to take that? Um, I don't know that this will be super helpful, but. This is what I um, told a group that I was mentoring recently of young women who asked a similar question. You know, how do I create space for myself? Um, how do I be present in a room um, where it might not be as diverse? Um, and what I said to them was um, to show up like you were no different, um, to not bring your, like not think any differently about yourself than any other person in that room. Um, I was on an executive leadership team. I think there was about 20 of us. Um, I was the only female in the room. Um, I didn't walk into that room thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm the only female here. I walked into that room thinking I'm in this role for a reason. I have got myself here. My opinion, my ideas are valid. Um, and so I held my own space in the room as well. So I would encourage your daughter to um, develop a way to hold her own space and to not think about herself as anything different um, in that room. Can I add to that just as, as a mother of two daughters? I think that what's really important is from the minute they come onto this earth, 
that you empower them, that you listen to them and you make sure that they feel heard. Because if they know that you're listening, then they will believe the world is listening. And if the world is listening, then they will not, they will feel empowered to speak and to put their ideas forward and to go, I'm here and I've got things to say and damn it if you're all not going to listen to me. So that starts at home. I'll add also just for funsies. Um, I don't like thinking that there's a lot of male and female traits, but something I have certainly noticed I've, I believe throughout my career in hiring and working with hundreds and hundreds of people, I find that females tend to negotiate with themselves before they negotiate in the room. And it can be over anything small. It could be your pay, but it could also be what role you're willing to go for. And I always ask the question of my 17 year old daughter, but what do you really want? And you'll always find it's something different than what they're asking for. And I've taken the same tactic when even just salary negotiating as the employer with my team, when they ask what pay they want, I always ask, did you actually want a different pay before you walked in the room? Because I have noticed, and I hate to stereotype here, but the boys will go in and, and ask for a higher amount than often the girls will. And I think it's because they've gone through a process in their head of like, oh, I can't ask for that. That would be too much. So they start down here done that again and by the time they finish up they're even lower so just even asking the question but what do you really want I think can often really go a long way did anyone else have any questions yes uh, oh. you mentioned the body system <laughs> no you're good um, and the question I have is would it be wise to prepare like if you have a female employee you need in car and buy it with the male or vice versa as long as the person is open and they they give a shit, then they're a great buddy. If they are, because I mean, we are not anti male. Please don't think that for one second. And I certainly hope we didn't put that impression forward. Allies are very, very important in our world. Anyone who is going to take the time, who is going to make the time to make sure that somebody is welcomed has a point of reference and has someone that they can lean on until they're standing up on their own two feet is going to make a great buddy. I, I feel like in the workplace it's that the vision of what the company is there to do and the values and how it's going to do it, it should be the universal trait with everyone that's there, no matter gender, age, race, whatever it is, that's the unifying force. And when that actually occurs, it, it really doesn't matter who you partner them with because you're all on the same boat. <laughs> Yeah, I might just add to that one really quickly. Um, so I think like a lot of my mentors and a lot of my leaders that have guided me, a lot of them are male. So honestly, it, it comes down to allies. It comes down to really caring. So even if it's another male, buddying another male, that's okay. That buddy might be a massive advocate. So that's all that matters. Everyone in this room has. So when we talk about pay inequity, we also frame it within that by paying for care, primary care. Um, so when we think about that, and we think about um, women taking time off family, um, and the fact that they're super trying to do that when they come back to work. Capacity or in a lower position already. That when we talk about banks and women, they're already still going to be behind the apps. Perhaps who are in the room to go away and think about how they. It, it's such a lived experience too and perhaps if I can share, I was working for a tech startup. I joined when there was just four individuals. Um, over the three years I was there, it, it grew to, to over 50. I was such a senior part of that team. I had a, I caught up with the CEO every day. I felt like it was my business. I was so committed to that business. I, I, 
I loved it. I thought about it every bloody waking second. And when I became pregnant, so excited, I shared the news with my CEO and I felt like instantly I became invisible. It's like he checked me out that I was leaving. Now I would have I would have worked all the way through and I would have worked hard the second I got the opportunity to come back. That's the way I'm wired. But I felt instantly discounted by him to the point when I was pregnant with my second child is when I actually started my business and I was delivering pizzas and working a retail job, having a startup, two to- like pregnant toddler, like I'm not afraid of hard work. I don't want to be discounted for that reason. And it happens. It still happens. And it's it's not cool. I'm just adding to your statement, really. <laughs> and if I could also add to that, I think that when you the right thing is what you're doing there is speaking to the employers in the room and saying paying that super makes a hell of a difference. Making the effort to ensure that someone coming back from parental leave is using what they call their keeping in touch days so that they aren't losing touch, so that they have the ability to step up and just quietly going into a lesser job, if they're paying them less, that's illegal, but doing what you can to remember that just because someone went and had a baby, we we actually do donate brain cells to our children, just a side issue, but just that, that they've come back, they are actually wiser because their lived experience is just so much broader and the number of things that that woman has had to juggle in order to be able to you know, look after her household, look after her her child, she's going to be a better employee for it. Don't forget that. Mm. Um, I'll add one thing, and it was probably just sorry, it <laughs> triggered me a little bit. Um, no, um, I had an experience. Um, I don't have children, um, but I'd been working in an organisation for ten years, very similar to yourself. Um, I didn't have any ownership in the company. I wasn't on the leadership team at that point. Um, but it was a small company, family run, so I felt very connected to it. I went to, day, uh, to work every day to succeed for the business because I felt bought into it. Um, and after 10 years, um, there was a, a leadership change and the MD sat me down in the boardroom one day and, and we were just having a casual conversation and he said, so you're not going to have kids anytime soon, are you? Um, and so for me, that was an indicator, even though I wasn't planning to, mm. that he was checking in on me to understand my commitment to the organisation. So Instant fear. Instant yeah. fear yeah. Um, and instant feeling like what I had done in the past could instantly be switched off in terms of the acknowledgement of that. Yeah. yeah. I'm conscious. Have we got time for a few more? Yeah. It's okay. So if, you wait, it's okay. If you can't tell, we are too. It's all good. Yeah. I'm not. I'd recommend calling your friendly HR consultant (laughs) (laughs) who works with a number of small tech companies on an ad hoc basis to support them with that kind of thing. And look, what you're honing in on there is absolutely correct. You have brilliant founders who know exactly what it is they're going to build and how they're going to go about it, who have no concept of the law, of what it may. And, and, And I get the phone call when something goes wrong and it's like, shit, what are we going to do about this? And laying that foundation is actually really important. So having someone on hand who understands that, who can preempt the, the questions, who will ask you and challenge you and say, you know, have you thought about this? What about that? Will help to actually then put together the foundations that will allow you to then grow that business to the point where hopefully you can bring your own HR on board. But certainly it's not something that you can pluck out of the air and no one's got the time to pour through all the different websites about all the different employment laws and all the different nuances. What it is that a startup needs compared to what a very large company needs very, very different 
and the ability to take that foundation and then scale it, get, get a little bit of expert advice is what I'd suggest. I'd also add, like, no one's perfect. Like, I had my own organisation coming from my lived experience that I've now shared with you, and I by no means always got it right, but it's this constant learning. And at the end of the day, this is a human need to feel included. Like, once we're fed, we've got shelter and we've got clothes on, we actually just want to feel safe in our environments. Like, this is basic primitive stuff that people are seeking and not experiencing in the workplace. And sometimes it's just even an awareness of, is that happening around me? And coming into work with a different filter on that can kind of help that I am conscious of time I actually just had a little sneaky look at my watch so I'll look I'll close there something I didn't mention at the start so we all volunteer for Girls in Tech Um, it is a hundred percent volunteer run and you can see by the amazing like powerhouses that are here next to me like these aren't women with kind of just you know little casual jobs like they've got pretty full-time careers and we dedicate a lot of time to creating these events to do it we're on a mission to get 25,000 members by 2025 it's free so please go ahead and sign up get your daughter too as well um in Australia, there is a, um, I'll get the statistic right, but we've got a 1.2 million job target by 2030. And in the tech industry, there's 650,000 jobs that need to get filled over the next six years. So the fact that we have such a huge proportion, not as big as it should be leaving, I think is something that's going to impact all of us. And I would dare to say that that number is going to get filled by a number of different sources, maybe from overseas. And this topic of inclusivity is only going to become bigger in all of our day-to-day lives. So it does impact all of us. And I encourage you all to kind of think about what part we all can play in creating more inclusive workplaces for us and in addition to diverse. So thank you so much for having us. Enjoy the rest of the day.